Welcome back everybody. It's a lovely evening out here in the Carolinas and I wanted to wait until the sun went down a little bit before making this video because it was over 100 degrees here today. So um, I didn't want to sweat horrifically in this video. It's going to be somewhat of a long video, but basically what we're discussing here today is something that I think is, uh, is very misunderstood frequently in the firearms world. And we're talking about 300 blackout specifically as it relates to velocity and barrel length with different loads and then uh, we also have some other issues that we're going to address at the end i put it out to my viewers earlier today i said hey what do you guys want to know about 300 blackout i'm delving into it anyway so there's a few things we're going to discuss uh, we're going to discuss uh, pressures in terms of like gas port sizes where the gas port should be length those sorts of things if you're running a silencer how does that affect it that type of stuff uh, pistol versus carbine i just said that twist rate um, how does that affect it? Why are certain rates still made? And, um, and then also how does it compare out of a sort of a pistol braced AR uh, in 5.56 um, versus 300 blackout? So we're gonna address that. I realize you guys probably see some reflections right now on the board. That's because I have some lighting here to uh, help illuminate us here because it is relatively low light. But on your screen, I will also roll in a very clear, crystal clear screenshot of what all these numbers are here. So we'll walk you through what we did. If you guys aren't following over on my B channel, check it out if you guys want to see the actual test being done. But what I did yesterday was I went out with um, five different 300 blackout uppers. So we had a, well, I guess rifles too, uh, 7.5 inch Caracal, 300 black, obviously they're all 300 black, 9 inch BCM, 10.3 inch Daniel Defense, 12.5 inch BCM, which is this little blaster right here. And then also a 16 inch Brownells uh, barrel, which a lot of people think, oh, why would you ever have a 300 blackout in 16 inch? We're gonna address that, fear not. And uh, the rounds that we used, we're 110 grain uh, guerrilla ammunition. It's their Lehigh uh, controlled chaos load. And then we went with um, some 125 grain uh, Hornady American Gunner, I believe, uh, 300 blackout. And then some 150 grain Fioki, just practice bulk, bulk stuff. And some 220 grain guerrilla ammunition um, subsonics with the Sierra uh, bullet in there. Um, so I wanted to give a wide range of what 300 blackout has to offer because that's key. That is one of the huge, huge, huge like stomp on foot um, things about 300 blackout that makes it a very cool caliber is that you can just do so much with it without having to change your setup. So it's very, very versatile. Um, so what I want to talk about is when this was first released, it was 300 Whisper at first, and then kind of as it became more standardized throughout the intro, in, industry, rather, it became 300 Blackout. It's really the same thing if you look at it. But all the uh, marketing literature out there at the time when it was introduced, and a lot of it to this day, unfortunately, says things like beyond the 9-inch barrel, you don't gain anything with 300 Blackout. 300 Blackout is optimized for 9-inch barrel. 300 Blackout is optimized for short barrel rifles. All of those sorts of things, that's what people say about it. People say there's no more powder burning after it goes uh, nine inches uh, past the chamber. None of this is true. All of that is wrong. Um, it may, here, here's what I would say to that, and we'll, we will show you detailed examples of it here in just a second. It, the rate of blackout can be very effective in, nine, in a nine inch barrel. That's what I will say. It is not the best blank, that is not any of that stuff with few um, exceptions to that. So to get into the chart, again, we had 100, 110 grain. Uh, so supersonic stuff coming out of uh, the, the 7.5 inch Caracal was at 200 and uh, or rather, excuse me, 2,108 feet per second. I will not read all these to you, rest assured. And then out of the 16 inch barrel, we were up around 2,400 feet per second. Now. Just to juxtapose that, to kind of bring everything into context here, um, for those who don't know, the 300 Blackout is essentially a fattened 5.56 round um, to make it be able to shoot a 30 caliber bullet. And something that a lot of people say is, why don't you just go with 7.62 by 3.9? It's much cheaper. You know, there's ammo and rifles and stuff that have been out there forever that are proven at this point. So why don't you just go with that? So again, just to look at this uh, velocity here, we're at 2,400 feet per second. And then we'll step ahead one second just to make this point. 125 grain Hornady, we're at 2,200 feet per second with green and blackout. So with Wolf, um, depending on the loads, I've chronoed over the years a ton of them out of 16 inch AKs, 16.5 inch AKs, I should say. 
And depending on if it's 123 grain, 124 grain, if it's hollow point, depending on what year it was made, who knows. Um, I always get somewhere between 2300 and 2400 feet per second. So the point I wanna make about that is, if you look at similar bullet weights, in 7.62 by 39 versus 300 blackout, so 125 grain here. What you will see across the board, regardless, there may be an exception to this with weirdo specialized powder. However, commercially available loads, what you will see across the board is you will see a one to 200 foot per second difference in those two rounds in a given barrel length. Uh, again, outside of really odd type of loadings that I that aren't commercially available, at least not widely, uh, that will be the case across the board. So does anyone ever say, like if you look around and someone will be like, yeah, 7.62 by 3.9 is optimized for nine inches. Beyond a nine inch barrel, you won't get anything out of a 7.62 by 3.9. No, no one says that because it's not true. So the same thing applies here and I just want to keep that in mind. So again, with 110 grainers, we gained uh, 294 feet per second moving from the 7.5 up to the 16 incher there. So significant there. In terms of foot pounds of energy, we gained 325. That's very significant, it's huge. Um, that's a very large uh, difference in terms of foot pounds of energy. Now, I wanna talk about uh, defensive use, hunting use, those sorts of things here real quick before moving on because it will become applicable um, as we go through this chart. So, um, Many of you guys may know, and if you don't, we'll try to put a link down below for you guys to check out. But uh, if you look at any type of ballistic studies over the years, whether it's you know as far back as around 1900s when the Army was studying 4570 um, up until modern times today, what you'll see is that uh, pistol rounds wound differently than rifle rounds. So pistol rounds is, a, is a way overgeneralizing. Generally uh, wound by crushing tissue as it pushes through. Um, and any type of you know temporary stretch cavity and things like that that you see that you may see in a gel test in terms of real world damage on human size life forms, it's really a moot point. It doesn't really do anything for you. Um, however with rifles that is not the case. Um, rifles have a temporary stretch cavity which turns into a permanent damage area, and that is significant. It also has the, uh, at least in my belief, I know it's debated out there, but it also has the capability for hydrostatic shock. So where does that happen? What velocity range does that happen? And if you do some research online, you're gonna see differing numbers. You're generally speaking, according to people who know what they're doing and have actually researched this and seen a lot of real world experience, generally speaking, that number is going to be somewhere in terms of velocity between 1800 to 2300 feet per second. Most folks believe for normal carbine size or carbine yeah, size, we will get into that here in a second too, uh, rounds. Somewhere it happens between 1800 to 2100 feet per second, um, and it's gonna change, right? So if it's a large bullet, like a 4570, you're likely to see those uh, rifle wounding characteristics on the lower end start to kind of creep up, and then, you know, like a 22 caliber, 223, you really have to be on the higher end of that spectrum to see those wounding rifle like wounding capabilities. And uh, if you don't know and you haven't done a lot of hunting, shooting something with a rifle round is dramatically different from a pistol round. Obviously each round is a little bit different, but in general, people who take, you know, two to three rounds to the chest with a rifle round don't get up and they drop really quickly and they don't do a whole lot of stuff um, between the time those rounds hit and the time they expire. There's always exceptions to that, but with pistol rounds, you'll see, if you guys aren't watching active self-protection, go check it out. You'll see people take you know, center mass hits frequently with pistols and do whatever they want for another 10 to 20 minutes, sometimes even longer, um, without needing medical care. So there's a significant difference there in that velocity, that temporary stretch cavity and the permanent wounding capability that rifle cartridges have. That diatribe aside. So that's why these numbers in terms of velocity are hugely important. In terms of energy, again, it doesn't really translate. However, um, a lot of ballisticians over the years will say that you tend to see rifle wounding capabilities. And again, it's, it's not like a, it's not a, it's not a line, it's a, it's a curve, right? So if you were to take, for example, this 110 grain uh, round here, and say you're getting 2,100 feet per second, and then you put it up to 2,800 feet per second out of a 20 inch barrel, just hypothetically. That, that's gonna be much more damaging. It's gonna be delivering much more energy at you know, those 2,800 feet per second. So there's a scale there, but you can still expect with this round here to see rifle wounding capabilities, at least at muzzle distances where we were measuring it there. 
So that's why those numbers are important in terms of energy, where you start to see that in terms of ballisticians. A lot of them will say around 800 uh, foot-pounds of energy is where you start to see those rifle-like um, wounding capabilities. So again, the energy here will become important um, as we go along. So. I, I, however, if you're looking for rifle wounding capabilities, I'd put much more emphasis on velocity than I would on energy, just pointing that out as well. Again, uh, 125 grain, we're looking at, at the max end, 2200. Again, we already covered it, but you're losing about less than 200 rounds, or 200 feet per second versus 7.62 by 3.9. Uh, the, if you're looking for hunting or self-defense and you're okay with a supersonic crack, this is where I would want to be in terms of velocity, in terms of bullet weight, those sorts of things in terms of uh, the actual BC of the round being likely to tumble and, or if the round is designed for it, being likely to fragment. I like the 110 to 125 grain rounds for you know home defense, self-defense type of things. Uh, with a lighter weight, you also minimize the possibility of over penetration versus a heavier weight. I know it seems counterintuitive to a lot of folks, but trust me on that, it's true. Um, so. This is where I like to be. My home defense, 300 blackout guns, I'm okay with the supersonic crack. I will, I will take the hearing hit. I'll have 110 grain uh, ammo in there. So that's not a, not a coincidence there that I say that. I believe it and my guns have it in it. So again, moving on to the 150 grain Fiocchi stuff, you can see there's not a whole lot of difference in terms of the 16 inch and the seven inch, seven and a half inch, you got 145 uh, feet per second difference. Same thing, not a whole lot of energy difference as well. I will say this for 300 blackout, some of the least, least efficient in terms of giving you bang for your buck, whether that be downrange performance, if you're trying to hit a target at 150 yards or 200 yards or whatever the case may be, um, or if you're talking about self-defense distances, um, some of the least effective cartridges out there are the 147 and 150 grain uh, loadings. However, those are probably the most common 300 blackout uh, rounds that you see out there simply because those bullets are available in 308 and manufacturers just literally stick them in a 300 blackout case and call it a new cartridge. Um, so yeah, for practice and stuff like that, totally fine. In fact, almost all of what I use for practice with 300 Blackout is the 150 grain Fiocchi round. But if we're talking about animals, uh, human beings, whatever the case may be, and stopping them from hurting you, uh, not the greatest choice in terms of weight. Uh, there are some hunting rounds, like Federal makes a fusion round that's actually pretty darn good. It's got a lot of penetration. Those like 20, 22 inches of penetration, but it's a good round. Uh, just be aware of that, though, as you're keeping or as you're thinking of 300 Blackout in general. And move over to subsonic. This is one of the things that makes 300 Blackout such an awesome round. This same rifle right here can shoot, you know, out at distance, can reach out and touch something very easily uh, with the right ammo at 300 yards. And then can, if you want to have subsonic capabilities to shoot stuff up close and personal, to not wake your neighbors, to not damage your hearing in a home defense type of situation, of course, if you're using a suppressor, um, subsonic is awesome. However, I will tell you, you lose a lot, as you guys can see here. So we have our velocity from the seven and a half at 953 feet per second, and then 1100 feet per second there with the 16 inch. So something else to cover there is the speed of sound. So if you're talking about you want to shoot a um, subsonic load and you can't have AR pistols where you live, you can't have SBRs where you live, or you just don't want to, uh, whatever, um, and you want to go with a 16 inch barrel, but you still want it to be quiet, you're going to be right on the edge there. 1100 feet per second uh, is going to be on the edge of being uh, subsonic. For those who don't know, um, elevation, humidity, temperature, all of those things pay, play a role into the speed of sound. So it's going to depend on where you are. Uh, I'd be much more comfortable with the 1027 range and anything below counting on it to be subsonic. And also something that you're going to see here, which is a huge difference, is the energy numbers here. So out of the seven and a half inch barrel, we're getting 444 foot pounds of energy versus uh, 1,096. On the higher end, we're really seeing a significant drop off. 593 foot pounds of energy with the subsonic versus 1,400 foot pounds of energy with the 16 inch. Uh, 1,400 foot pounds of energy is nothing to uh, joke about, guys. That is a hard hitting round. And uh, again, we're talking about you know, things that are this size that I am right here. So that is um, really 
the gist of it in terms of barrel length. Again, if you guys wanna actually see the video, go check it out. It's up on my B channel and you can see the entire process happening. But I will tell you, uh, what do I think about it? What, what would I go with? Again, I already talked about that. I like the 110 to 125s. That's where I'm comfortable. There's a lot of really good loads out there. The one I use for those who are gonna ask is the uh, Gorilla Ammunition. It's the uh, Nosler Varmageddon round, I believe it is. It's a nasty round. I have a gel test of it on the channel if you guys want to see it, but I, I feel very comfortable with that round. And my home defense uh, guns right now are BCM 9-inch uh, SBRs. However, this little guy right here is in the running uh, for, for taking over one of those slots simply because I do like the additional energy that we get out of it there. It's not uh, insignificant. So um, that is it in terms of velocity, energy, all those sorts of things. Again, you guys should have seen this in detail rolled in here on your screen, but I wanted to debunk this optimized for nine inch crap because that's what it is. It's, it's, it's bunk. Ignore it. Do not listen to it. It is wrong. Um, so there is that. We already talked about these issues here. Just some other questions that people asked. I want to get into that as well. So pressure, silencers, gas box, buffers. This question actually came in from a gentleman who runs the Fit and Fire channel. If you guys aren't haven't checked him out and you're interested in gun content, check it out. Um, but he asked, he said, I'm setting up a home defense uh, AR pistol with a 10.5 inch barrel that's going to be suppressed. What do I need to do in terms of setting it up? I.e., do I need adjustable gas box? Do I need a heavier buffer? Those sorts of things. The answer to that is generally speaking, no. Um, in terms of over gassing issues, 300 blackout is much, much more forgiving than 5.56. Um, just for instance, this one right here, I can roll in some footage of me shooting it and it has a carbine buffer in it right now. And we're shooting the footage that you guys are seeing, 150 grains of supersonic stuff. And it's suppressed with a Gemtech 300 uh, blackout can out there in the end. It's fine, yeah, I don't see it being an issue there. However, if you have to, or if you notice signs of overgassing, first thing I would look at is upping that buffer weight. It's just the simplest, uh, most fail-proof way to do it. Uh, I tend to avoid gas blocks, adjustable gas blocks, as much as you can. I have a full video on that, you can check that out as well. Um, but um, I haven't heard of any scenarios where folks are running a suppressed 300 blackout and they're having reliability issues. Um, Again, as long as they have like an H2 or H3 buffer, if that's a thing, if you're getting overgassing, um, I've not heard of it being an issue. I've not seen it being an issue. I shoot, you know, literally thousands of rounds of 300 blackout every year, 95% of them suppressed, and I have not seen it as an issue. So I would say, generally speaking, no, test it out. If anything, drop H2, H3 buffer in there, and you guys should be good to go with that. Uh, pistol versus uh, carbine gas link system. So this uh, debate is very, in terms of 300 blackout, is very similar to um, the 18-inch 5.56 debate. So a lot of people want to compare carbine and mid-length in the ARs. I kind of think that's not really where we want to think about in terms of pressure changes throughout the system. It's much closer to an 18-inch, uh, do we have a mid-length or do we have a rifle length gas system? What I mean by that is, regardless of where you're at, so you only really see carbine length gas systems when we get out beyond 12-inch and 300 blackout. Um, but Regardless of where that port is at, whether it's at the pistol length uh, spot or the carbine length spot, the size of the port really is what's gonna matter most. That's generally speaking true across the board for direct impingement guns. However, um, as if you delve into any forums uh, and you guys are gonna see, I'm getting an 18 inch barrel, should I get a mid length or a rifle length? Uh, people will talk about the port pressures and all of those sorts of things in dwell time. Um, but everyone who knows what they're talking about is basically gonna say, both work fine, as long as their port size is correct. The same is gonna be true here if we're talking about carbine versus pistol length gas systems with 300 blackout. Again, you only really see the carbines in the 12 to 16 inch barrel. Um, both of them work, both of them are fine. You're cool, as long as the barrel manufacturer knows what they're doing and size the port correctly. Um, all right, twist rate. So I recently, uh, like last week as I'm filming this, who knows when you guys are watching it, did a video on this rifle right here, which is our pistol, I should say, the 7.5 inch Caracal 300 blackout. It has a one in five twist rate, um, which is pretty radical for 300 blackout. Generally what you see today, you know, years ago, you used to see a lot of one in nine twists. Today, generally what you see is one in seven and one in eight twists. And every now and then you get weirdo companies like SIG and Caracal. I'm, I don't mean that derogatorily, I'm just saying companies that are out there on the edge like Caracal and SIG that are doing like one in five twists and stuff like that. Um, what I will tell you is that 
with that rifle, I was, or pistol rather, I was a little bit concerned that it might not stabilize supersonics well because of that really fast twist rate. Didn't see it at all, it stabilized them fine in the actual testing that you guys saw for those of you guys that watched the video. I will also say that I have a ton of one and eight, I don't even know how many, one and eight um, 300 blackout uppers. And I've read reports and get a ton of questions of people saying, uh, why would you ever use a one and eight twist if it can't stabilize uh, super, or subsonic ammunition? I've never seen that. I'm ne I never. I'm not saying it hasn't happened at certain altitudes with certain specific loads. It's entirely possible that a one and eight may not stabilize some supersonic ammo. Sure, or rather subsonic. Excuse me. I, I'm, I'm saying that correctly. Subsonic ammo due to the long OAL of the round. I have never seen it in person. So. Um, what I would say in terms of twist rate, what, what do I recommend? Fourth random black, I would say one and seven, one and eight, one and six. That's kind of where I'd feel comfortable. The barrel length is going to play into that as well in terms of stability. For those of you guys that don't know, there's some online stability calculators. You can go online and plug your data in for your barrel, your bullet, your length of your barrel, twist rate, all that stuff, and it will tell you how stable the bullet will be roughly. So check that out if you're concerned. Again, I would feel comfortable with anything one to six to one and eight twist rate uh, for general purpose use. The last question here is a total video. Well, all of those actually are videos I could do full length videos on, uh, or questions I could do full length videos on rather. This one is definitely probably going to be a video one day, but I wanted to quickly address it because I know it's going to come up a ton. Today in 2019, AR pistols are all the rage, right? So everybody's got an AR pistol. I got like 10 of them. Um, so, so they're popular because obviously you don't have to deal with the NFA BS in a lot of states. So uh, the most common for 5.56 for sure is going to be 10.5. Now I have a whole video on AR-15 barrel lengths for 5.56, which is kind of similar to this, but uh, I will say I'm a huge fan of the 11.5, but 10.5 is the most popular, so we're gonna address it, right? So if you were to get, like, let's say you're debating, you're like, should I get 300 blackout or should I get 5.56? I'm gonna get a 10.5 inch barrel. Take a look at the data here on this 10.3 inch Daniel Defense V7, and you can kind of get an idea. Now, what I will say is I just picked a round at random, something that's popular, something that's very well documented, and something that is a good self defense hunting round, etc. Uh, the mark. Uh, 212 mod 1, it's a 77 grain load. Out of a 10.5 inch barrel in my use, I'm getting right around, again, depending on the day and the atmospherics, 2400 feet per second. So if you're getting 2400 feet per second, you're, we're talking about 970-ish, uh, depending on the day, uh, foot pounds of energy. Again, we're gonna go over here and kind of check these two out, right? That's obviously a supersonic round, so we're getting supersonic crack. So you gotta take that into account. We're getting 2200 feet per second out of that out of the 110 grain, 1900 feet per second out of the 125 grain, and our uh, actual energy is dramatically more. So again, 970-ish for the 5.56, and that's a 77 grain, so that's a heavy hitting round uh, for 5.56. Energy is much higher for the uh, 300 blackout supers that we have there. So something to consider, is it the end all be all? No, um, but it is something to consider. Another thing to consider that folks always wanna know about, obviously it's gonna be cost of ammo. So 5.56 five, for practice stuff is definitely cheaper. There's just the fish that jumped behind me. Anyway, 5.56 five, is definitely cheaper to practice with. Uh, there's no getting around that in 2019 anyway. That is the case just simply because of scale and just competition in the marketplace. Now 300 blackout has become much more, uh, I don't want to say inexpensive because that's not the right word. It has become less expensive over the last two to three years simply because the caliber is being adopted much more widely and ammo companies can make more and take advantage of those efficiencies of scale that I just referenced with 556. Five, um, generally speaking, you can see 300 blackout for about a 50% increase in price. Uh, if you guys aren't following me on Facebook where I post a lot of ammo deals and stuff like that, definitely follow me over there. That's the place you're probably gonna find a lot of the best prices on the internet, tell you the truth. Um, but it's definitely more expensive to practice with 300 blackout. That said, the majority of shooters out there, I talk to a lot of you guys. I go to a lot of uh, gun shops, those sorts of things. I go to a lot of shows. I interact with a lot of folks. The majority of gun owners don't fire a thousand rounds a year out of their guns. So if that's the case, does the extra cost really matter? Maybe, you know, that's up for you guys and your finances to decide, but I would say for most people, it's not a huge impact. And I would go with the round and the caliber that you think does what you want it to do the best. If what you want it to do is versatility and cost isn't a huge deal, 
300 blackout all day long, in my opinion. Um, if you want it to do some of these really cool things out here with the supersonics in terms of energy and relatively uh, short barrels, and cost is a factor, might want to look at 7.62 by 3.9. Uh, it's, a, it's a great round. And uh, again, lots of proven, proven uh, bullets, proven uh, rifle systems, pistol systems, et cetera, for those. Um, if, but again, if you want it to be able to do all of that, and have a really low back pressure and not be super gassy like 556 five, tends to be that's one thing i should point out as well so one thing just the way 300 blackout works and the chamber pressures and all of those sorts of things and the gas system pressures if you're talking about gas to the face in a suppressed gun there's no question 300 blackout is much less gassy um, if you're using a similar suppressor those sorts of things so if you want that type of capability again 300 blackout definitely wins over 556 five, all day and it also wins over 7.62 by 39 um, so that's pretty much it. Hopefully you guys learned something. Uh, if there's more stuff you wanna know about 300 Blackout, let me know. I will do the work for you, work up a video. If you guys wanna know, if you want details on that 556 versus 300 Blackout video, I can do that too. I think that's probably gonna be a, a frequently or a highly requested one. But yeah, hopefully we cleared up some of the stuff and the, the myths and misinformation that's out there about 300 Blackout. The nine inch one especially, I hate that one. It's totally wrong. Don't believe it. Next time you hear somebody say it, be like, oh, do you not have to aim a shotgun to inside a home to hit him either? Like, <laughs> he's the same dude. The same dude that says, I don't have to aim a shotgun for home defense is the same dude that says, yeah, 300 blackout is, is optimized for nine inch barrels. Anyway, that's my rant. That's my soapbox, guys. Thanks for watching. I truly appreciate it. If you're looking for good deals, check out my Facebook page. If you have a question that you actually need answered, message me over at Facebook. That's where I answer all the messages that I get in there. I don't see them all on YouTube, Full30, Facebook, wherever else I'm posting videos, IGTV, but I do see them over there in my inbox, so that's the place to hit me up if you actually need an answer. If you aren't subscribed, you like this type of video, hit the subscribe button. If you are subscribed, you're not seeing at least three videos a week, hit the notification bell, because for some reason, YouTube's not putting my videos in my subscribers' feeds these days. Who knows? And uh, that's pretty much it, guys. Thanks for watching, thanks for subscribing, and I hope to see all of you in the next video.